the second thought uh, uh, about thinking and about the thought that we've been discussing uh, these two days was my response to the invitation from uh, Brian, Tony, and Rupert uh, to, as it were, become at this very late, very late stage in life, a Caribbean intellectual. In what sense could I possibly claim to be a Caribbean intellectual? Not in the most obvious sense of the term at all. My work has not been largely about the Caribbean. I have not been actively present in the enormously important work of trying to write the history of the Caribbean in the period of independence. That's to say, including writing its past from the perspective of an independent nation. I have not been party in that deep way to the project of writing the history of the nation. I'm a Caribbean in the most banal sense, in the sense that I was born there. But uh, that accident of birth is not enough to justify uh, owning up to the title. And I have to confess, although they don't know it, that I did seriously think of saying to them, I'm sorry, but I'm not a Caribbean intellectual in the sense in which I think you ought to be honoring people. And the reason why I decided not to do that was because uh, reflecting on my own life and practice, I have to say that although in many moments of my life I've been thinking about what many people in the Caribbean would think as other problems, other places, other dilemmas, it seems to me I have always been doing so through what I can only call the prism of my Caribbean formation. In that sense, I'm committed to the idea of the politics of location in thought, which does not mean that we can only think the things which are possible to think from a certain position, that all thought is necessarily self-interested because of where it comes from or anything like that. But I mean something rather looser than that, that one, ne one never can escape the way in which one's formation lays a kind of imprint on what one's interested in, what kind of take one will have on that topic, what link linkages one wants to make, and so on. And uh, in that sense, uh, that is true even about uh, so-called cultural studies, uh, um, with which, of course, inevitably, uh, my work and my career has been identified, which I feel a certain responsibility for every now and again. <laughs> which I've tried to evade as far as possible being responsible for, <laughs> tried to evade having to defend it, made rude noises about it so that people would think, oh, well, he doesn't really, it not really belong to him after all. But nevertheless, one feels a certain responsibility for it. Well, cultural studies has its own internal history as a discipline, but when I think about why I ever got into it, I know I got into it in part because before what is called cultural studies ever began at Birmingham, I had the problem of trying to understand what Caribbean culture was and what my relationship to it was. And I put it that way because my relationship to it in terms of its natural origins. That's to say, you know, he's born here, so he's a Caribbean, so he's a Caribbean intellectual, because in intellectual, that kind of natural uh, logic doesn't work. My relationship to the Caribbean was one of dislocation, of displacement, literally and figuratively displaced. You know, my life uh, as a young person, as a child, as an adolescent, was spent here. I left at 18 years. I've never lived in the Caribbean since then. A relationship then, a negative relationship, you would think, of displacement and dislocation. Uh, a dislocation in a deeper sense, because the reason why I was uh, so committed to leaving the Caribbean and the reason why, in some ways, I never returned to live here had to do with my colonial formation, with my formation as a colonial subject. 
Now, because there's so many young people in the audience, I want to remind you, you know, that this, I'm talking about something very specific. I'm talking about being a colonial subject, not a post-colonial subject, you know, a colonial subject. I left uh, for England, you know, 12 years before independence. My whole formation had been as a child of the colored middle-class Jamaican society. And my relationship to that background, which I don't want to go into in a personal sense, I have only to say that I felt, as a subject, consistently out of place, both in relation to my family and my personal formation, and in relation to the society in which I had been born. I didn't, when on, uh, on, uh, to the point where I left Jamaica, I did not understand what was the source of that dislocation. But uh, uh, I thought it was a largely personal one. It wasn't until much later that I discovered that this was an experience of dislocation, experienced by a whole generation of intellectual people. When I went to London, there they all were hiding out, all of them making some kind of escape attempt from this colonial society, all of them on the search for becoming modern subjects, but with the bizarre thought that you had to leave the place in order to become a really modern kind of person, you had to go somewhere else, not anywhere, of course, but right to the heart of the dislocation itself, to that which had, at a distance, dislocated you. And when I say dislocated you, you know, I'm talking about serious stuff. I'm talking about never feeling at one with the expectations my family had for me of the sort of person I should become, of what I should do with my life, and of dislocation from the people themselves, from the mass of the people from not being able in some way to find myself in the context in which I was born, brought up, and lived. And I thought, this is a recipe for disaster. The thing to do is to get out of here, go somewhere else. There's a wonderful passage in Laming's Pleasures of Exile, a book which I strongly recommend to you if you're interested in this period of Caribbean intellectual history, and especially you must appreciate and enjoy the ironies of the word pleasures, the pleasures of exile. In which Laming says, you know, we all at a certain moment, every one of us writers, without exchanging a letter with one another, a message, just picked ourselves up and went to England. Turned around, discovered we we're all here. Laming, Nye Paul, Vic Reed, Mittelhalser, on and on and on. The Caribbean novel, West Indian novel, as you know, was created in London in that period. What a bizarre thought. What's more, as Laming says, this generation first became West Indian in London. Even worse bizarre thought. When I went to London, I had met, really seriously met, only one other person from elsewhere in the Caribbean. He was a Barbadian, and I never met anybody so bizarre in all my life. I'd been taught by the Welsh, taught by the Scots, taught by the English. I was extremely familiar with them. But who and where was Barbados? We didn't know anything about the, uh, the, the rest of the Caribbean islands. We discovered ourselves as West Indians somewhere else. And having, as it were, gone away in order to try to evade or escape the reality of the colonial world with which I could not come to terms here, blow me, first of all, the whole colonial world seemed to deposit itself through Paddington Station on my doorstep. Within two years, the black diaspora had arrived. So, you know, the thought that one had successfully escaped the problems of the dislocation of colonial experience, you know, unfortunately, that was when the Caribbean decided to take the last leg of the triangular trade and discovered what, you know, what, where it had all started. You know, let us go and see what's happening over there. So the notion of 
of evasion, uh, uh, you know, escape attempts, as I sometimes describe it, and it was completely unsuccessful. So the, the, the connection with, you know, in the sense in which I can be said to be a Caribbean intellectual, is only through trying to go somewhere else not to be, you know, trying to put a distance between myself and an experience, a way of experiencing myself with which I was always, uh, um, uh, 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 with which I was always unsettled, uh, you know, in the wonderful exhibition that you've done for me uh, uh, in the library, there is one missing photograph. It's a photograph of myself at about five. And uh, I, I look, um, uh, I mean, I'm in trouble at five. Something is seriously wrong with my feeling about being at home in that place. I do recommend you to read Edward Said's Out of Place, which is the account of exactly such a moment, of exactly such an intellectual, in an absolutely other part of the world. Okay? And I want to say that what happens at that moment is suddenly that one discovers that what one takes to be a personal, entirely personal experience somehow is a representative experience in quite different worlds, right across the world, at the same conjuncture, in the same historical moment, from so many different points of the orientation in the universe, from so many different backgrounds and experiences, the same crisis of being out of place in the world, of not at one with the person one is summoned to be, is being experienced by very different people, by writers and intellectuals at a certain moment. It is a certain moment, I discover this, it is a certain moment in decolonization. It is the moment you know, when decolonization is coming to a crisis. It is the moment when that process is beginning to unroll. It is a particular kind of colonial crisis. It is lived from the inside as a subjective fact, and yet at the same moment, it is a matter of objective historical conjuncture. It is part of the circumstances into which one has been formed, born, etc. So, uh, I, I speak about the, the experience of dislocation. I want to be absolutely clear that in this sense and in nothing else that I say is there a recommendation of a general you know, intellectual trajectory which everybody needs to now get on the boat and you know, do for themselves. I'm talking about, you know, one moment, one particular moment, that moment is gone, you know. Uh, the, the, the circumstances have changed. And the whole configuration has reordered them itself. You may feel out of place now, but it's a different out of placeness. And believe me, the solution of that is the different one from the one I took. This is not a recommendation about how to become an intellectual in general. This is an account of how it just happened that I became one. I became a certain kind in a certain moment, in a certain space, in a certain historical conjuncture, a certain kind of intellectual. That's to say, I learned to think in a certain way in that way. That's what I mean by through the prism of the Caribbean colonial experience, through the prism, through the form, formed as that kind of colonial person. There are many other kinds of colonial persons. There are many other people who did not feel out of place in, uh, uh, in Jamaica. And I don't know that out of placeness has to be a necessary precondition for intellectual work. But I, I tell you, you know, this is one way of learning how to think. It's one way of coming into that.